as many of you know, I love to preach messages that are very extremely motivating and encouraging. And this is in a way, but we're dealing with a subject that's extremely heavy. And in a way, the very music that we sang this morning kind of put us in that place of being a little bit more contemplative, a little bit more reflective. On December 21st, I was home on my AWS day, alternate work schedule. For those of you who are traditional guardsmen, it's that day we look forward to every nine days where we get to just relax, drink some coffee, and take the day off. We especially appreciate those days after a drill weekend if it happens to fall on. But I was home, sitting there drinking coffee. How many coffee lovers here? Dunkin' Donuts, Starbucks, I don't want to know which one you like better. But here, listen, getting ready to leave on a trip to go see my family in South America and Brazil, a time where all of us were going to come together and celebrate Christmas, <coughs> a good season for all of us. You kind of get into the spirit of Christmas. You get excited about all that that means. And then all of a sudden, I just got a phone call out of the blue. And on my phone, it said Major Salino. I said, she never calls me on a Monday. It just doesn't happen unless it's not good. And I picked up the phone and she said, Chaplain Tilly, you need to get a couple of chaplains in here as quickly as possible. Uh, two of our own were killed in action. At the time, they weren't releasing the names in Afghanistan. But you know what, folks? I went for one moment of drinking coffee where the rope had broken. There was no more celebration in my heart. Now there was devastation. And I'm, I'm just a human being. And knowing that I've got to go with Chaplain Torres to make the notification is the scariest thing you can do. Who in the world wants to go to somebody's house during Christmas and tell them that this Christmas will be unlike any other Christmas they have ever had? You want to bring good news. You want to bring gifts. You want to bring cheer. Chaplain Torres went to the Juan Casa family and I went to the Lem family to bring them the worst news that they could ever hear regarding their loved ones. And you know, something goes inside of you and it says, it's just not fair. It's just not fair that this stuff happens in this life. You know, one thing I realize in life is that life is full of losses, folks. Not just some. We might edit things out of our minds, but it's, life is full of losses. It's sobering when you think about the fact that absolutely nothing around you is permanent. There's nothing. You'll go through seasons of tragedy. Some of the younger student fighters may be perhaps too young to go through some of these things, but I hope I can touch on some of this for you as well. But there's seasons of grief, there's seasons of loss where you have a crisis that takes something or someone that is very important to you away from you in a snap. You can lose your finances, your people in here that have been here, you can lose your job, you can lose your health in one day, you can lose a relationship like a marriage. And the one thing that's inevitable for us all, and I don't want to talk about it, in fact, you need to know this, Life insurance was not always called life insurance. It was called what? Hell. Death insurance. It's negative. Nobody wants to talk about it. I don't even like to talk about it. But the fact is, if I don't prepare you for the inevitable in some way, then I'm not doing my job as a shepherd that loves his flock. And I love you. So it's tough to talk about the tough stuff. But the bottom of the line is, you can change it to life insurance, but you don't collect it until somebody dies. And that's dad burn sad. But you know, we so remove reality from people that when it smacks us, we don't even know what to do. We're devastated. Nobody ever told me it would be like this. I want to share with you to, a way to prepare. And we do this in the military all the time for the day or the season when one of these types of losses is going to come into your life. I want to share with you five means. I only got time for two today, so we're just going to do two. But they're to help you to recover from all of life losses, the different ones. I've read books on grieving. I've listened to sermons on grieving, anything that I can get. Why? Because I've gone through my own in my own life. And I've learned so much that when I was going through it, I researched it more so I could get more healing for me. 
And ultimately, my misery in some way can be a ministry to others to be able to help encourage them and encourage you. I can't tell you the countless times as my mom was dying of cancer and I'm sitting there preparing sermons in a chair next to her on a laptop as she's dying. And I'm dying, but i got to still do my job on Sunday morning and I'm losing my mom. Where the day I got the call up here on, on August 8th, 2010, picked up the phone, my daughter's screaming, Mom's dead. She died tragically, my wife. Like that. In an instant, my first wife. We were up here, we were praising God, folks. Worshipping the King of Kings. And in the next moment, two significant people in my life, gone. Well, you're a pastor. You're supposed to have all this spiritual energy. Folks, I'm a human being. And sometimes we hide our pain from others and we walk around with a smile on our face like, it's okay. And you know what we tell other people? You're supposed to be like that. Stuff your pain down. That's the right thing to do. Praise God and smile. Baloney. I will never tell you that. It's nowhere in the Scripture. Nowhere. We're going to see what the Word of God says. It says in Ecclesiastes, and I don't have it up there for you, but let me read it to you. It says, sometimes in Ecclesiastes 8.14, sometimes something useless happens on earth. You ever feel that way? This is useless. Bad things happen to good people. This is what the Scripture says. And good things happen to bad people. You know, one thing about God, He's always truthful with us. He always tells us the truth. Because that's the only thing that prepares us for life. It's the only thing that sets us free in this life. You've seen it happen in this life. You would need to understand two important truths before I ever get to the two handles of grief. Let me say this to you. The first thing is this. You need to understand that we don't always get what we think we deserve in life. Does that make sense to you? You don't always get it. Do I want you to get it? Yes. But it doesn't always happen. <laughs> We have this myth in the back of our minds. Tell me if you don't have the same tape. This is because I, I have the same tape. Bad things happen to us and occur because we're bad. Good things happen to us because of our goodness. Do you ever play that tape? Neither are true. When good things happen to you folks in life, that's called grace. When bad things happen to you in life, it's called life. And this life is lost. It's broken. We can go all the way back to the Garden of Eden and disobedience and how a disobedient spirit breaking the heart of God and the will of God and not following the ways of God caused brokenness in this world. Why, why do we have a military? Why do we have a military? Because until Jesus returns, there is really no peace on earth. You're fighting for peace. I want to tell you this. We won't get that until Jesus ultimately comes back. Do you understand that? In Luke 13, and members, some of you remember the story, two contemporary issues take place. About innocent people, innocent Galileans. Remember, Pete, the whole story. These Galileans were worshiping God while terrorists came in and butchered them. It sounds like today, but it happened 2,000 years ago. And the question they were being, they were asking Jesus, is it it's because they sinned, right? No, it's lousy Galileans. Had nothing to do. The second thing, remember the tower of Siloam? The question is asked, they're walking along, marching off, all of a sudden this tower literally falls on and kills all these people. And then immediately people point fingers, ah, they got some evil going on in their hearts. They deserve that smack. You know what Jesus said? Had nothing to do with it. It just fell. No explanation. Except that Jesus in that moment says, you know what? When these things happen, it's a good reminder to repent now and get right with God before those things do happen. That's what Jesus says. He seizes the moment <laughs> to say things break in life like that. Are you ready? Are you prepared? Do you know Him? Have you repented? And the word repent, I've told you folks, not penance, it's not something we do. Repentance is simply saying, Jesus, you died for me. You rose from the grave for me. I've been going in this direction. You know what? I need to go in your direction. I need you as my Savior and as my Lord. 
Jesus said in both of those situations, it wasn't the fault of those people. Those things just happen. Listen, folks, sometimes we do things that are wrong. And we do reap. Not the benefits. Lord, I think of my own thing. I've opened my mouth a few too many times. And I've said the wrong things. You know, how many of you know people that say, I just speak my mind. How's that working for you? All right, let's continue. The fact is you say stuff and you say, I wish I could just take that back. But it's out there. <laughs> we're not called to speak our minds, folks. We're, we're, we're called to guard what we speak before we speak. Think about it. You better season it with salt. All right, because it could be death. It can be destruction. It could crush other people. I know, sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm my own biggest enemy. What is the teaching? The fact is this, folks. Sometimes in life, you're going to be the innocent victim. Can you hear me? Could you say that with me? I'm going to be the innocent victim. Sometimes in life, you're going to be hurt when you don't deserve it. Had nothing to do with what you've done. Do you see, that's what God wants you to know. Sometimes you're not going to have an answer as to what that life loss was. Sometimes it's going to be unexplainable. The other thing is, not everything that happens is God's will. I hear that all the time. Well, that was the will of God. Folks, I want to tell you something. When children are beaten and they're abused and they're murdered or they're killed by a suicide bomber, that is not God's will. The Word of God says God is not the author of evil. Okay? He's not. Don't read, people redefine his description of who he is. We can't blame God for all the bad things. He's grieving as much as you are. He created freedom of choice. And when he gave freedom of choice, guess what? People make the wrong choice. And when they do, people die. God could stop drive by shoes, He could stop suicide bombers like the ones that killed Lamb. And, Bonacasa. and it would be real easy. Listen, you need to hear this. All he has to do to stop it is to take away their freedom to choose and they couldn't and wouldn't do it anymore. But, to be fair, he'd have to take away your freedom to choose too. The fact is, God did not create us to be puppets. He created us because his hope was that we'd be, be obedient to him and follow in his footsteps instead of our own. Do you hear that, folks? Are you listening to what God? He loves us. Because we ask that question, do we not? You could have stopped this. I said that about my own wife. You could have done this. But I learned the lesson of life is that God gives us the freedom to choose and we don't always choose life. God's not going to force His will upon you. Well, He can force His will. Folks, listen. The Bible says, can I, that God's will is for every person in this place and on this space around the world that they'll give their lives to Jesus Christ. Do you realize that? That's in the Scripture. It is His will that you develop a relationship with Him. It is His will that you repent and you receive this gift of eternal life. And it is His will is that you go to heaven. Obviously, that's not true. Everybody does not make that choice. But it is His will. But He still, in His will, allows freedom of choice. Alright? Everybody doesn't develop a relationship with Christ. To follow his ways. Why? Because God's will is not always God. Free will is something he still has intact under the umbrella of his will. That's why we pray. How many times do we pray the Lord's Prayer? Father, thy what? Will be done on earth as it is where? Because in heaven it's done perfectly. Guess what, folks? Not down here. Never. Not in the way it needs to be. 10% good is not a good enough. I can't explain all the tragedies of life, all the disasters, all the losses. I can't. Some things we're not going to know and get to know this side of heaven. And I've asked the why question, still in blue in the face. But I can give you some handles, folks, that will help you in a biblical way to walk through what you're going through, even perhaps now in your life, or will in the future. The first thing in the next slide is this, folks. The first thing is, 
When we go through seasons of loss, we have to what? Just say it out loud, the first point. Release. Release. You've got, we talk about deployments all the time, but you've got to deploy your pain. Do you understand? We go into deployments. You have to deploy your pain. If you hold it in, you have now employed your pain. When you employ it, it's going to employ you in a way and cause you to go to places you don't want to go. It's the worst employer in the world is to hold on and not grieve and just stuff it. Crisis always produces strong emotions, folks. Loss, anger, fear, depression, <laughs> worry, loneliness, guilt sometimes. I've experienced every one of those. When my first, wor- uh, first wife, Donna, died, I was devastated. I couldn't sleep. I was a mess. I was angry. Folks, when you have a major loss, when you've been handed a pink slip, or somebody in your immediate family is suddenly taken away, we have enormous feelings that bubble up inside of us. If you don't deal with them now, it will take far longer for you to make any progress in life. That is the bottom line. Where is it biblically? I'm going to show you in just a minute. Some of you have never dealt with grief in your life. Loss. Because somebody told you to do this. Take your Christmas stocking and stuff it. Hang it in the closet. That's the best thing you can do. The upper lip. That's what people tell you. You push it down. You pretend it's not even there. You play like it doesn't exist. I hope as you're hearing this, listen to all the authenticity, the reality. That's not there. That's why 30 years from now, you're still struggling with the same emotional stress that occurred 10, 20, 30 years ago. You're still messed up in relationships. You can't respond. You've distanced yourself from others. You're still dealing with a former partner with anger that's never been worked with, a friend who's betrayed you that you've never dealt with, or some hurt that you've had, and you're carrying it with you all these years. The only good grief. Remember Charlie Brown, folks? He used to say all the time, what? Do you know there's good grief? Paul is in the back. She's a grief counselor. There is good grief. It's when you express it, share it, and deal with it, and you don't stuff it. That's when good grief becomes bad grief because it ultimately becomes a poison to you and it's toxic to you emotionally and to you physically and to you spiritually as well. That's the bottom line. There's a myth that says God wants me to walk around, folks. I'm not, I, I've, I've heard this with a smile on my face all the time. The Bible doesn't say that anywhere. I see it nowhere in Scripture. This idea that I'm never to be sad, I should never grieve, I should never feel pain, I should never hurt. God wants me simply, when I'm going through the loss of a job, the loss of a loved one, praise the Lord. Folks, have you ever been exposed to this phoniness? In some way, people think that's spiritual. Well, that is not what Jesus says. What does He say? Folks, listen to this. Jesus taught the opposite. Can we go to uh, Matthew chapter 5? What does He say? Next slide. No, back, back, back. Too many... Who's that? Shantae? She wants me to end. Go back. All right? Number two. Next one. Good. We're making progress. There we go. No, back one. <laughs> Don't you love it? This is logged up Remember that old time? Anyway. Look, can you read this for This is Jesus speaking, folks. Does he say when you're going through a hard time, just smile, praise God. It's okay. I don't feel nothing. What does it say? Blessed or what? <laughs> Could you read that again for me? Bless what? Who mourn? If, if we were to put it in the opposite, it would say the person that doesn't mourn is not what? And, and will not be comforted. Folks, God's promise is always true. His light is always true. Blessed are those who mourn. Listen, folks, loss is inevitable here. Grief is not. You choose to grieve. You choose to mourn like you choose to brush your teeth in the morning. And I hope you do. Listen. The bottom line is in the Scripture, Jesus taught the opposite. He said it's not only okay to grieve. 
You need to grieve. He's telling you loss is tough. And this is the way I bless you and I walk with you through your loss. Folks, if you sit there at a funeral and you don't cry, you better look at your heart because something's not right. You're not only broken, but you got more stuff broken in here. When there is a total disconnect, I'm just going to be strong. Whoa. The greatest strength you can give is what Jesus did at the death of his friend Lazarus. What did he do? Suck it up and say, thank you, Father. He's, he wept. He cried. He deployed his tears. Because he's real. And he wants us to be that way too. Folks, I'm, am I yelling at you? <laughs> Some of you are here for the first time. I'm not coming back. <laughs> This chaplain's nuts. I'm nuts about you. Okay, that's the bottom line. I don't want you walking out of here knowing that God doesn't have a way to help you process your pain because He does. He said, blessed are those who mourn, those who choose to grieve. They will be comforted. That is His promise. I know it. I've felt it. I've experienced it. When somebody's a Christian, folks, and they die and they go to heaven, we don't grieve like the world grieves. We know that there's an afterlife. There's a resurrection in the future. Billy Graham, love him. This is what he wrote in his book. He said, our hope in heaven tempers our grief. Hear that. Our hope in heaven tempers our grief, but it does not erase our grief. That's the reality. When we grieve over someone who has died in Christ, we are sorrowing not for them. They're in a better place, but for ourselves. We're the ones left behind. To deal with the agony and the pain. Our grief isn't a sign of faith, lack of faith. People say, well, you're grieving, it's a lack of faith. No, it's a sign of how much you love. I don't grieve for my neighbor that lost somebody. I don't know them that well. But if it's somebody here that I know, the more I know you and the more I know the family member that died, I am going to grieve because our grief is not tied to our faith. It's tied to how much we love. The more you love, the more you grieve. That's normal. That's reality. You know, I was I was sitting in my office and uh, upstairs earlier, and I said, God, I'm a little baffled. You know, I've read the word blessed a ton of times. Folks, I know somebody's going to give me the time check here shortly. Hang in there with me, okay? We good? Stay in your seats. We're going to keep moving, all right? And I said to the Lord, I said, God, what about this word? Man, I have heard it translated. Happy are those who mourn. And ultimately you. They're, they're, your happiness will return. A joy will return. Will you be normal? No. It'll be a new normal. It'll be a different normal. But you'll get back things. Listen to the grief counselor. If you talk to Paul, she'll tell you this. The people that grieve the most they do really good in life because they work through their pain. But I asked the Lord, I said, God, I, I, I said, Lord, the word blessed, I'm, I'm, how does this, what is this? What do you want our people here to walk away with? And he spoke this word to my heart. He said, blessed is simply this, son. I will put my arms around the person who says, I'm really hurting. He will comfort me. The word blessed here means I will hold you tightly in my arms. I will let you experience my presence, my hope. I will give you what you need to walk through this. I will walk through this with you. Not around. I'll walk through it. <coughs> he says, blessed are those who mourn. Not those who walk around. But who walk through. You know what's so funny? You know, Sometimes you just need a confirmation from God. Hillary comes to me later. We're talking over here. I got the confirmation. Two of the worship leaders are over there. You know what? Hillary comes over and said, that word blessed. It means God put His arms around us. No prior conversation. But a confirmation that you need to know that God will walk through your most difficult times together with you. He doesn't leave you. But you need to release your pain. You know when you read Psalm 62, look at look at look at David. Here's a king. Here's a commander who 
He's lost the people that he loves. What does it say that he did? What does it say? Pour out your what? Oh. Folks, does it say, you know, I'm sorry, this? You know, or does it mean drop dump the cup? It says pour. It doesn't say trickle. It says pour out your heart before God. Let it out. Cry it out. Listen, listen later on in Psalm 42. My only food, and some of you have been there, day and night is my tears. I feel forgotten by God. This is the psalm. I, God, I don't know where you are. My soul is downcast and I am disturbed. David was expressing his grief and his feelings to God. I want to tell you something, folks. When my first wife died, I was so angry with God. No, <laughs> angry with God, folks. I'm being real with him. Not disrespectful. I didn't call him names, okay? But I got before him and I said, God, I am so angry. In fact, you know, I'm kind of strange, folks. I went to the gym because I cried my eyes out at home all I could. I go into the sauna. Anybody has been in that hot room? Hot, cold, steam? I wait for everybody to leave because that room... Paula was a reflection of how angry I was. I was hot. I was mad. I would, everybody would walk out and I would just begin to cry out to God. Where were you? Why? How in the world is this any good? Why didn't you stop it? I loved her. The kids have no mother now. I always told them. How am I going to raise these kids? How in the world am I going to do it? I'm scared to death. How in the world, God, am I going to lead a church? I'm so freaking broken. How? I let it out, folks. I had it out with Him. You know, the, the Scripture, people were quoting it, Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is close to the broken heart. He saves those that are crushed in spirit. I said, Lord, I don't feel any closeness. I don't feel anything but my pain right now. Where are you? I was angry. But folks, I let it out. God's big enough to take your pain. The psalmist, pour it out before Him. Don't lock it down. Bring it to Him. If you mourn, He will come to you. I'll never forget what happened. And I know I only got a couple minutes. We're only get through one point. Is that okay? One point, one point, that's it. One. <laughs> Yeah, but Tilly, you'll be up there for two hours with one point. You're right, but let's... I was so mad. I don't feel you. I don't know where you are. I don't know where you were in this incident. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what you're... Are you preoccupied up there? Because I don't know what's going on. Are you aware of what's going on in this world and in my life? I don't sense you. Now listen, folks, God's not... Hopefully may not respond to you this way. This is what He did for me. Later on that day, I started losing my hearing. This literally happened. I went to the ear, nose, and throat specialist. They did the hearing test. They looked into my ear. They have no idea why you're losing your hearing. I couldn't hear music in my car. I couldn't hear the climbing of the weights at the gym. I couldn't hear anything. And I'm standing there and says, Oh, well, thanks a lot. I don't have enough to deal with. Now I can't hear anything. <clears throat> At that moment, the Lord spoke to me. So you can't hear. I finally have your attention. I had to shut everything off, Tilly, because you just don't listen. He shut off my hearing folks, so that I could hear Him speak the words. I'm here with you. I am here with you right now as close as you want me to be and I will walk through this dark time with you he shut off my hearing thank God so I can hear his voice and the only wants me to do is pass it on to you and when you go through the broken times in life he promises to be with you. He is close to the broken place. And in that moment, he was so close to me. And it didn't remove all the pain, folks. 
I'll talk next week or next month when we come together again about the importance of counsel. Important of going to God and having our hearts counsel. But he wanted me to know and he wants you to know that whatever you face in your life, he may not have to shut your ears off like he did mine. And by the way, the second part of that story is right after that, me, many of you, I got in the car and I couldn't believe it. I could hear the music. My hearing came right back immediately. That was for me. That's for me. The Lord promises to be close to the Lord.